from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. I'm Tracy Grant, editor of Kids Post at the Washington Post, which has been a proud sponsor of the National Book Festival for all of its 11 years. And as editor of Kids Post, there's one thing that I know about kids. They can smell a fake a mile away. An author who writes dialogue that doesn't sound real will have her book tossed aside. A writer who has kids respond to situations in a way that kids can't relate to will have his book discarded. But find a writer who creates characters who connect with kids because they don't just seem real, but because they are real, and that author has created a reader for life. That's the magic that Rita Williams Garcia creates with her characters. It's never more true than in One Crazy Summer, her book from last year, which won the Coretta Scott King Award and was a Newbery Honor book. Delphine, Venata, and Fern are sisters in which, can see, in which kids can see, if not themselves, then their siblings or their friends. And because the characters are so vividly and honestly drawn, the rest of the story about a key moment in American history becomes completely believable to kids reading it as well. Even if they have no idea what a collect phone call or the TV show Flipper was all about. About her writing, Williams Garcia has said, when I'm not working, I'm daydreaming, plotting out the next story, listening to understand my character. Then I'll get excited because I learned something that I didn't know and I start to write. We are all better that Rita Williams Garcia has learned so much from her characters and we should all be enormously grateful that she has decided to share what she has learned with us, her readers. I am thrilled to present to you Rita Williams Garcia. I'm sorry, I'm very excited. And if I don't let my nervous energy out, I will not settle down into this speech and actually read it to you. I might dance it out for you. Something always gets lost in the translation. So, um, well, first of all, just, oh, what a wonderful celebration of, of the love of literature and storytelling. and and just the human spirit and, and, and liberty. This is the place of liberty. We are in the center of liberty because we use our words and we are not afraid to use them, express them, and share them. So, okay, so um, let me now go on with the show. Well, um, uh, I, am, I am going to, I, I part, um, please pardon me, I'm going to read my, my presentation to you to keep me honest. Alrighty, and make the timekeeper happy. All right, anyway. Well, I love writing stories. I've been writing stories and telling tales since I was a girl, from the projects in Far Rockaway, New York, to army bases across the country, in Arizona, California, and Georgia. Coming out with a story costs you nothing. You don't have to wait and save up your money to tell a story. You don't have to ask your mother, who doesn't want you to ask her for anything in the first place, for a nickel to write a story. All you have to do is sit down and let everything empty out. The things that you've done, the things that you should have done, the things you should not have done, just things. Let all of that out. Let it go and free your mind and just imagine. Or daydream. Take a what if trip as far as you can go then start writing. That's what I do. If you've read any of my stories, I hope you've come to know that I really do love creating my characters. It's safe to say that I'm a character-driven writer. I like imagining what they look like, what they sound like, what makes them say the things that they say. 
What kind of families do they belong to? Do they have any families? I can spend the whole day just daydreaming, staring into space, imagining who my characters are and why they are the way they are. I've grown up around some pretty interesting characters myself, family members in particular. But I think it's my family members, former classmates, or even the people who I see on the streets who spark my desire to build characters. But it's my family members who've helped me build my own character. You've heard someone say, now that was a character building moment, or you know, he or she really showed character. Well, we were like a lot of young black families in the 60s when I was growing up. My, my parents were very hardworking. They expected a lot from my siblings and I. Not, not having enough money was never an excuse for anything. My father, on the other, on one hand, was the type to explain things to us logically and patiently. My mother, on the, on the other hand, was the no joke part of the duo. She didn't believe in sugarcoating anything, but with both parents, you better not even look like you were about to cry or they'd give you something to cry about. So it was the 4th of July parade in Seaside, California. I was in the fifth grade and I was watching the parade with my mother, my sister, and my brother. My father was in Vietnam at the time, and his allotment check was very slow in coming to us. Now, all, all I knew about that was it was some kind of bi uh, adult business, so yeah, I didn't think about that. All I knew was we were facing some pretty hard times. So we're at the parade, and my mother's going to buy us some chicken. They were roasting whole chickens at one of the stands, selling whole chickens, half chickens in these little paper cartons. The chicken was smelling good. Now, believe me, I think I was the only black child who just didn't like chicken, but I liked chicken that day. Well, my mother bought not a whole chicken, not a half chicken, uh, but she bought one single chicken wing. She had three napkins. She broke the chicken wing into three pieces. Now. At that time that she's breaking apart the wing, there standing before us are two boys from my classroom. Now they're pointing and laughing, and I saw them, and you know, or I saw them just in the nick of time. Because, you know, before I saw them, I was going to use my place in the family as mommy's baby to ask for my own chicken wing. In hindsight, Maybe special, special place in the family or not, maybe that might not have been the question to ask my mother. But here are these boys laughing at me and my family, and I knew I was supposed to be embarrassed or humiliated. The secret was out. Our family was so poor we couldn't afford three separate chicken wings. So, you know, there's a lot that you can see in the blink of an eye, even as a child. I saw these boys laughing at us. I saw the brutality of my mother yanking that wing apart. I also saw that she wouldn't have anything for herself to eat. So when I took my chicken wing, I said, mmm, and took a bite and did my little chicken wing eating dance and watched the parade. Now, of course, my mother told me to straighten up and stop acting so simple. Um, and um, truth, to, truth be known, I hated that chicken wing. There was no meat on it. It was smoky and burnt. And I didn't like chicken in the first place. But I smiled and ate and gave a so what shrug when two of my class, when those two classmates pointed at me. I ate, chewed on the bone, and watched the parade. Now, there were quite a few other moments in my life that kind of called on my, my inner sense of character um, that I recall, and strangely enough, they always involve my mother, Miss Essie. One, one that all, will always stand out in particular, 
is the, ha, has anyone heard of Les Brown and his band of renown? Okay, some of the, alrighty then. Okay, well, one of the, one, one of the wonderful things about living near an army base is that, you know, a lot, of, a lot of musicians, they will really give all to the soldiers and soldiers' families. So the school that I was, uh, that I attended was uh, pr predominantly um, attended by uh, military families. So Les Brown and his band of renown was going to come to our school. <sighs> I had to hide that notice from my mother. You don't understand. Miss Essie was nothing like any of the other mothers. The other mothers wore these nice gingham dresses. They wore aprons. They wore gloves and hats on Sunday. They baked cookies. They did not burn cookies. They baked cookies. So I knew, well, my mother, on the other hand, wore pedal pusher um, uh, pants. OK, anybody know what pedal pushers are? They're kind of the grandparent of the legging, you know, kind of body hugging. OK, so that would be my mother's kind of outfit with the heels and, um, and her fancy hats. Uh, not a church hat, but a fancy Miss Essie hat. And now, you might not see it from me, a direct descendant of my mother, but my mother had what was called a bombshell figure back then. And so whenever she walked, she carried the jazz band with her. So you can hear her walking down the street, ba boom ba boom boom ba boom bang, bang. Now, we often walked with my mother, three Negro children that we were, my sister, brother, and I. And while she's w marching to the band, we're, we're following behind her like this. <laughs> it wasn't just the walk. She had to talk to all the people like she was in a parade herself. So she would always wave to the people who would always honk at her. And yes, they always honked. And, the, and she would talk to them. So it was just always kind of, why can't our mother just bake cookies? And oh, so, OK. So I hid the flyer because I knew, I knew if she knew that Les Brown and his band of renown, if they were going to come to the school, she would be there in full Miss Essie. So I come home from school. I go to my room to do my homework. And my mother comes in, she says, Rita, don't get dressed. We're going up to the school. Why, Mom? Come on, let's go. Let's go right now. <sighs> so here we go. My mother is walking to the school. Boom, ba boom, boom, ba boom, bang, bang. You know, and she's got a few symbols going on and what have you. I'm hoping at least she gets it out of her system before we get to the school. But then we get to the school. And we near the auditorium, the place that's filled with my teacher, some of my students, a boy that I liked. And we come down the aisle while the band is in full swing. And my mother is just bang, a bang, boom, boom, walking in the room. She's taking over the whole place. And so while they are, while they are playing, my mother makes sure she goes all the way to the front. And she's talking to the band. And they seem to like it. OK, I didn't know that until I replayed it in hindsight. But she's saying, all right, boys, Miss Essie is here. Let's have a party. And you know, and so what am I doing? But. The next day, I had to go to school. 
you stand online, you're in recess, and everybody is just, oh yeah, we saw your mother, we saw your mother. And it was the chicken wing eating thing all over again. And I said, yeah, that's right, that's my mother. Bang, boom, I had no hips, bang. But I had to show what I call character. And that was yet another one of my moments of kind of showing character and not being ashamed of my family member even uh, on the outside, even though <laughs> I just wanted to die. And so, you know, um, I thought about moments like that when I set out to create my character, my main character, Delphine, in my latest novel, One Crazy Summer. I, I, I'd never written for young people. I, I always wrote for teenagers, so kind of venturing into that next level, um, kind of to the younger reader was kind of scary for me, you know? What, what, would they be interested? But I still wanted to share a part of my life of uh, growing up in the 1960s um, because it was a very exciting time and I kind of remembered it fairly well. It was a, just a time of great social and political change. So I dreamed up Delphine, who was 11, Vanetta, 9, and Fern, 7, along with their mother, Cecile. Gee, where did I get her from? And, a, a small cast of characters, but I knew the girls would be spending the summer with their mother who abandoned them earlier, um, and that their mother would be a poet, and that when they arrived in, uh, from Brooklyn to Oakland, that they, would be un that they would be unwanted by this mother who abandoned them. And, and so in order to have something to eat because she wouldn't cook for them, they'd have to go to the center ran by the Black Panthers. Well, most of all, I knew it would be up to Delphine to look out for her sisters, whether she had to protect them from their mother who wasn't thrilled about having them there, or protect them from whatever was going down with the Black Panthers, or protect them from each other, because I'm sure you all know that brothers and sisters and, uh, or siblings, I don't know, every once in a while they might fight. Um, so I knew she'd have to swallow up a lot of her girlish inclinations and show a lot of character. But that would make her heroic. And sometimes a heroic character can be hard to relate to because they might do the right thing all the time and you know that might make her hard to relate to. So I remembered what it was like to be 11 myself and I, I meant well but I was by no means perfect and I thought I knew everything but of course I didn't. Um, so I, I thought I would build on Delphine's character um, and keep those things in mind. I thought of her strengths as well as her feelings would make her more real and closer to the reader. So I just want to share just a little bit from uh, the chapter called The San Francisco Treat. Now Delphine and her sisters, are uh, they're in Oakland, and they have planned an excursion to San Francisco, which is right across the bay. So, um, um, okay, so. I told my sisters, don't say a word. Just let me do all the talking. Even though I knew Cecile didn't care, I didn't want her to suddenly take an interest in us and start asking questions. If she asked questions, I'd have to spin a lot of straw. And I couldn't spin a lot of straw and look her in the face the way I'd like to. Like I'm 11 going on 12 and I know what I'm doing. Well, I chose that to share with you because it says a lot about Delphine's character and who she is and what her limits are. Um, she knows she knows she's going to choose her words carefully and tell her mother what she wants her mother to know, but doesn't want to lie to her mother. In other words, when she said, uh, she, when she says, "I don't want to be less," I. I don't want to be able to, I want to be able to look her in the face the way I like to. You know, she has a real, she really thinks highly of herself. Um, and, but also, she likes being the oldest. She likes being in charge. She thinks she knows what she's doing, probably because she's had the responsibility of taking care of her sisters all of her young life. So now, this mother responds with, I'm not coming down to no police station if you're out there stealing. Y'all have to spend the night in jail. Now, that was as good as a be safe and have a good time as we're going to get from Cecile. 
And I'm sure that that says a lot about the mother. Like, uh, the, like my mother, she doesn't sugarcoat. Um, so when, when I write, I like my characters to reveal themselves to the reader by things that they say, things that they do, but also by the things that they don't say. Maybe they mean the exact opposite of what they're saying. I'm not coming down to no police station. Y'all have to spend a night in jail. Well, she might really mean this, knowing Cecile, or maybe she doesn't mean this, but she can't say what she really means. So building characters creates an opportunity for discovery for me. As I write and learn about people, uh, the power of frailties and the un uh, unpredictable nature of, of people, now, for um, older teens, I've written a story called Jumped, which is told by three characters. Girl A knows that girl B is going to um, jump girl C at the end of that school day. And that, uh, that story takes place um, over a period of one school day. Now, the least bit of action from any one of these girls could have the greatest impact on the story. Could, uh, it could facilitate great change. But now, I'm not going to give it away, but if you do read it, just remember it all boils down to building character and showing character. Well, um, I'm, to close this up, I'm, um, I just want to share something with you in that um, a, few, a few years ago, I did a workshop uh, at this settlement house, and it's just, it's a family settlement house um, where families go to get a little enrichment. Maybe there's language barriers, maybe there's economic barriers, and so forth and so on. But I did a little workshop with second graders, and at the end, one of the little girls said to me, you are my favorite character. Now, I'm quite sure she meant that I was her favorite author, um, and, but I, I really liked what she said to me um, because, you know, I, I hope that I inspired her to want to read about interesting characters or write or draw or dream about interesting characters or more important, I hope I inspire her to be an interesting individual and I hope I've inspired you all as well. So. I am, I am done. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, so, are there any questions? If there are questions, stand up to the mic. Come on, to the mic, to the mic. Delphine. Oh, how did I come up with the name Delphine? Okay, this, I'm going to tell you the real truth. Normally, I would just keep it short, but this is a little long. I was working at a soul-killing job, um, and uh, it was just time for me to quit, and I had to, I said, maybe it's time for me to write another story, and I could get a little money, so let me think of the story that I'm going to tell. So while, I, while I'm thinking of the story, I am typing a letter, to an email to my editor who is sitting right in front. Raise your hand, yes. <laughs> and um, uh, Rosemary Brosnan, and, and so I'm just kind of typing away. Um, I want, I'm gonna write a new, I'm gonna write two stories, and the first one is called one crazy summer, and it's going to be in 1968, and uh, the mother is going to start running, and the girls are going to have to run after her, and their names are, uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh. and then I said, okay, come on, come on, uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh. and then I said, okay, Delphine, okay, yes, we like that name, it sounds grown, Delphine, and then I said, uh -uh, uh -uh. Uh, 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 Vanetta, Vanetta, okay, Vanetta, all right. And then I went, uh, uh, I said, all right, okay, so I've got these two exotic kinds of names, Delphine and Vanetta. You can't have a third exotic name, no. It's gotta be plain. Fern, Fern, yeah, oh, that's like a period, Fern. Nothing more, Fern. So, yes, I kept doing that all night, Fern, Fern. So. I finally, so I had my three girls, Delphine, Vanetta, and Fern. And so as I was writing, I said, uh, Rita, 
what do you think Delphine means? So I went to, I went to um, uh, the dictionary and I looked it up and it said dolphin. And I was like, oh, I named my, 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 um, I, I named my character after a dolphin? She's not a dolphin? And I said, well, Rita, if it's upsetting to you, I'm sure it's going to be upsetting to her. Name her Delphine. So that's where, uh, so that's where that came from. I, th I thought it was from my imagination. Surprise. Thank you. Question, uh, 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 question. What inspired you to write books? What inspired you to write books? Oh, I used to tell a lot of tall tales when I was little. Well, I've always liked stories. You know, my sister, first, um, my, my older sister used to put picture books inside my uh, playpen in my crib when I was about like 18 months old. I was not allowed out. I was in the penitentiary in my little wooden playpen. And so she would always slide picture books in there. And so I, uh, my mother had already taught me my alphabet. So I would be re reading these books and actually reading a little bit. And then, you know, after the story was over, I would always imagine more. Always imagine more. And I'd always sit in my playpen and think about the stories. But then when I became really um, talking and out and about, I could never tell my mother the plain truth. I would always add a little something to it. So, um, you know, so my mother used to say to me, oh, Rita, that's so good. You need to write some of that mess down. You know, and so I thought, I thought she was encouraging me to be a writer. I said, wow, that's great. You know, so. I did that, and I've had, I've had notebooks, and I've been writing stories since I was probably about five years old, you know, and, and I have a whole stack of notebooks, and, <laughs> um, and, and I can't stop. <laughs> so, thank you. Yes? Hey, um, one of the scenes that really struck me in One Crazy Summer was the entire deal with, I think it was Fern's doll, uh, yeah, and yes. I was wondering where that came from, the entire... Oh, the KB. Um, okay, so I, um, what happens with Fern's doll, and I don't want to ruin it for everybody, but uh, Fern's doll is decorated. Uh, she's a little, she's, Miss Patty Cake is a little, is a little white baby, you know, or Fern thinks she's light skinned, but she's a little white baby with, with uh, uh, blonde hair, and, and uh, Fern has had her since she was born. Um, and um, one day her sister corrects her, corrects the doll, and, um, and so uh, the reason why I did that was that I remember how my, um, how badly I wanted a black doll when I was a little girl. And so when my cousin sent me a Thumbelina doll, it was a dusty rose uh, color. And I said, look, she's light skin. Okay, I'll take it, you know. Um, but I wanted a black doll so badly and uh, they, j they just weren't quite making them back in the 60s. And then when they finally caught on, um, they were making them with this paint color that, you know, was it was it like a self-hating kind of paint color that was like, uh, I dare you to love this doll. And, you know, so um, I, I, I've always thought about that, what you take close to your heart and everything and, and what, would, what would make love, you know, kind of dissipate and all of that. And I thought about uh, Fern and her relationship with her doll and that she's had it forever. But it, it really comes out of um, kind of so many different places, not one particular incident. But uh, thank you for asking. <laughs> so, yes. Hi. Uh, I was inspired by the 60s too. A great time for storytelling and, and inspiration. So I'm wondering uh, what kinds of stories do you think might come out of young girls or boys growing up in our time? Ooh, you know, I think really only they can tell us, you know, um, I hate to speculate on that because to me, I think for me to speculate on it is to limit. They, they can only see it from how they see it, what, what is important to them, you know, and I, I'm not always sure I know what that is. So, um, but I mean, the very things that I might find interesting, 
um, they might see a different aspect of it. But I, I'm, I, wouldn't, I would love to see the science fiction that will come out of kids today, because I think they're a little bit more challenged to create science fiction because the technology that we keep coming up to is really incredible and intuitive. So I would like to see how the mind really reaches um, to create the fantastic. And, and uh, that's what I would like to see. I, I'm really interested in the science fiction that someone would want to create. Great, thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi, thank you for uh, such a uh, enthusiastic present presentation. <laughs> it, was, it was great. My, my question is um, a little bit different. I, um, I'm always interested in how writers write. Mm -hmm. So in your case, I'm just interested in kind of like, uh, do you more or less like go with ebb, the ebbs and flows of your inspiration, or do you have kind of a routine uh, in terms of the uh, how you uh, get books written? Well. Any writer who has to feed themselves with their writing can't just go with the flow. You really have to develop the discipline. And, and I've had to become a lot more, um, uh, well, yeah, I'm going to tell a lie. I've, I've, I've always found time for writing, but um, it's always been different because when I worked a full-time job, that time was designated for me. I only had my commute. And so, you know, that w and my lunch hour, and that was basically it. Um, but these days, now that I that I do write a good deal of my time, I also teach part time. Um, I start the minute I wake up. I I, w I kind of roll out of bed into a sitting and writing position. And I start writing now. Doesn't mean that what I write is usable, but um, I, I just feel like my brain is still very kind of open to suggestion, open to more than just the physical, because I'm still in a quasi dream state. So I write the first thing before anything can really impinge upon my mind before I start to remember that, oh yes, I pay bills and I have to think about, you know, my daughters and, you know, all of these other things. I, I, I use that time. Um, I, I write freely and I write in pieces. I used to write straight arrow. I used to start beginning and then just go to the end and I can't do that anymore. I write um, I will write the piece of the work that has the greatest impact. And then those pieces really help to inform me of how everything else will work. And then I start to bring everything together. So that's how I'm writing now, you know, but um, I, I, out of necessity, I have to. Um, but thank you so yeah, much. Thank you. Yes. What was the first book that you wrote called? What is the first, uh, what is the title of my first book? Okay, my, uh, the title of my first book was actually Blue Tights Big Butt. <laughs> and then I couldn't sell it. Why wouldn't anybody want to publish with that? I, a winning title. So um, I had to change that um, and, I, and it became Blue Tights. And I wrote a story about a girl who had an enormous talent for dance and she wanted to dance the ballet, but she, had, she did not have a dancer's body. So, it was a, so it's a story for teenagers and it's all about how this girl comes to like what she looks like, you know, and discover the dancer inside of her. So thank you very much. Uh, the, the yes. Uh, how has the National Book Award changed you as a writer and changed you as a reader? <laughs> how has the National Book Award changed me as a writer and a reader? Um, you know, what? Uh, I had the joy of serving on the committee for the National Book Award in 2002 and also in 2005. And this was a wonderful, um, immersive um, uh, process for me because I got to really read um, hundreds of great books and books that are striving for greatness, so to speak. And it really helped me to pr uh, appreciate um, children's literature in a, in a different way than, you know, as someone who just works, I, I mean, I worked in a separate 
uh, in a separate industry, and so I was not as connected. So that was number one. That helped me a lot to be in the world of children's, of writing for teens and children. Um, but now, when I heard that I had been nominated for uh, a National Book Award, uh, I, I literally uh, jumped up and down. I don't know if you all could actually believe that, but <laughs> I could not stop jumping up and down. I thought I was just, uh, yeah, it was just really, um, uh, it, it was, uh, yeah, well, yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, the following year, when I received the call that I had, uh, that I had um, uh, won, uh, that I was nominated yet again, um, I ha it was the day after my, I th think it was the day after my daughter's wedding, and uh, uh, friends of mine uh, had come out to California where the wedding was to go to the Na go to Napa Valley for the day, and I was getting ready to get on the bus, and I got the phone call from my editor, Rosemary Brosnan, um, and there I was trying to get on the bus, jumping up and down, um, and, and it's somewhere on YouTube or something. Anyway, um, but being nominated uh, for such a national prize, it is, let me tell you, it, is, it has such a tremendous impact um, for your book and for what it is you want to put out there for readers. There are so, I, I don't fool myself, there are so many fabulous books out there, wonderfully disturbing books, wonderfully engaging books, great books out there that don't get any spotlight. So I am appreciative of any kind of notice that uh, that my book gets, and what it has done for me was um, allow me allow my work to uh, c um, uh, come into the schools and uh, for people to get to know me, and schools that maybe have small budgets, maybe they can only get maybe a national book and a Newberry and a Coretta Scott King and a, um, a Puta Belfry, you know, maybe they can get those books. And so then it helps me to be on a, on a short list of books that maybe a school can order. So, you know, there, there's just no end to what, um, to what that means and what it does for a writer, especially someone who's kind of struggling to stay in the game. So um, it's just been wonderful. Oh, thank you. Yes. such an amazing, extraordinary award. What is your inner child saying from when you started winning? What is that saying right now that you won this award? Oh, I'm sorry, say that again? When you, now that you've been awarded with such an amazing award, what is your inner child saying right now? Um, I think you're saying my inner child. <laughs> I'm the oldest 50, the youngest 54 year old I know. I, um, I am just, uh, <sighs> yeah, I, I'm so, I'm just really so appreciative and just, um, I, I, I jump a lot. As a matter of fact, I have a jump rope. And I jump maybe 500 revolutions every other day uh, because I have, I have a lot of energy and it's not just physical energy. I think it really just comes from the joy of being able to do what I do, you know, do what I love and do it for a living. I mean, wow, you know, I, you know here's the thing about being a writer or probably any other artist, okay? We are perhaps the only ones who say, oh, I got to write today. I got to work today. Oh, I did some really great work today. Okay, I'm sure there are other professions that they enjoy their work, but we really, um, I think we really value the ability to just be able to do our work and, and having an award like that makes it possible for you to pay your bills and see a doctor and eat some food and, you know, do all those things and, just live in the world of your books. Now, I have said a couple of times, I am a daydreamer. Now, you can't be daydreaming, oh, we're here. You can't be daydreaming if you have to pay the bills. But being, um, but uh, having a lot of these awards have really allowed me to stay inside my head, which is really inside my inner child's head. So, uh, yeah, yeah, so it's a good thing. <laughs> OK, 
okay, the question is if my mother is still alive and has she seen all this wonderful thing, all these wonderful things happening. Um, well, my, my mother has passed on in uh, 2003, but uh, trust me, um, see, I've grown up with my mother. I know her. She's kind of still here. I know what she's saying. She said, all right, Rita, all these stickers, they pretty. Where's the money? So <laughs> I get it. I get it, you know, so. Um, <laughs> But I know, I know she'd be, I know she'd be very happy for me. You know. So, alrighty then. I thank you all for sitting here captive. <laughs>